Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to the Great Canadian Aftermarket Trade Show uh, virtual conference session on women in industry. Um, well, with me today, uh, uh, it's my pleasure to have uh, Josie Candido of a High Park Master Mechanic, who has really uh, carved out a very special place in the industry and in her community. I think uh, all who know her would agree, but we'll dig into that some more. And Catherine Jones, uh, who is a an exceptionally uh, skilled young professional in the aftermarket, having been named the young professional in the aftermarket <laughs> uh, uh, previously. So a real standout. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, their experience uh, in the aftermarket, um, how, you know, and, and maybe dig into a little bit how it might have been different uh, because they are uh, both women or maybe not different. Uh, and where they see it and maybe we'll pick up some pointers on how uh, we could make it more welcoming for those who come uh, in uh, uh, as women into the industry. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to start uh, actually with with Josie here uh, just to uh, you know Josie runs a well I'll just I'll just uh, Josie tell us a little bit about your shop and uh, how you see it fitting into the community. Well um, we've been there since 1999 so it's been 23 years. Um, it's been a, a, a heck of a journey. Um, I started working at head office um, in 1992 and I fell in love with the industry. Um, I could talk about it on and on. Um, anybody that gets me on the phone knows like I could just keep going on about the automotive, something I love and I'm passionate about. Um, so when I saw the location up in the late 1998, um, I was helping franchisees and I was really, I, I learned that there's something that could use my platform and I loved having interaction with people. I thought the community would be great and we would be a great fit. And it's been a heck of a journey since then. Um, uh, so there's so many memories, there's too many to even talk about. Um, it's, I, I love it. Um, it's been welcoming, there's been, many people that have supported me. I've surrounded around people that um, my community, my team, and other people in the automotive industry that have always cheered me on, ignored any noise in the background. If I didn't feel it was whatever, I just ignored it. And I just kept trailblazing and following all the other women that have trailblazed in our automotive and any other sector, any women that have made changes um, over the last uh, even hundred years. And um, it's been incredible. Sure, let me just, uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, things that uh, uh, has really, uh, people have really found, uh, uh, frankly, kind of amazing and inspirational in, uh, uh, in, in uh, the community that, uh, uh, that Josie's shop serves is, is their signs. And I'm, so I'm just going to see if I can find a one here that uh, that I, I pulled up before, uh, and uh, oh, I don't know that I can, uh, but uh, they're, 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 you know, signs like uh, 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 just uh, with inspirational messages and uh, messages of hope uh, in the community. Uh, these are all uh, very uh, uh, well uh, received. I think is probably the understatement uh, in the community and helps really to dis distinguish uh, you, not not necessarily you know from the competition in that sense, but but as as a, a an entity within the community, right? Um, when when I started, um, part of opening the shop and 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 trying to to cut down those bias and and make it an inclusive. Uh, an environment that people walk in, they don't have to stress. And it was so weird. Um, I, I, honestly, I got this Google review yesterday and it literally put me in tears. And it's literal customer, it's literal. And I, I, I just would love to read it because it literally, I don't know, summarizes what I am, what I want my team to be, what I want it to be in the community. Um, her name's Emma, it's a Google review from yesterday. And um, I, literally, I don't think I could have written this, um, like it's, it's almost too perfect. Uh, the most important thing in a mechanic is honesty and integrity, quality of work. Master Mechanic High Park has those things. 
but they also have a real part of the community and a business with a social conscience. I literally smile when I drive past their colorful mural, murals and inspirational signs. Every other week, they seem to be participating in a charity drive or supporting a social cause. All if none of that matters to you, they still have a really good mechanic, which is all of them, but especially Rui. Um, he can do anything. Um, I can speak to whether their prices are super competitive or not in Toronto, but I've gotten my money's worth in the customer service time and patience. No matter how busy, they always make time and effort to answer questions and help their customers. They are super transparent when discussing repairs, and they will let you know if something can wait without compromising your safety. I was so stressed about finding a local mechanic because as any single woman knows, and of course I'm quoting her, um, uh, yeah, I, sorry, uh, as any single woman knows, let me go back, that it's like walking into a repair shop and immediately feeling that you're being taken advantage of. I've never had that experience before. I really regret not finding, um, um, finding them before with my other vehicles. Um, I mean, the only complaint she had is she hasn't met Charlie yet. So um, I haven't, I had COVID and some other issues and she hasn't met Charlie. So she says, my only complaint is that I've never met their dog mascot, Charlie. I'd love it if when I, I called to book service, that they would inform me if Charlie would be around that day, that would just be helpful. So as for me in the industry and my team, I, I, it, it sums everything up. It sums up my 23 years in career and what I wanted to achieve and all the things I wanted to achieve. I, I use my business as a platform for all the stuff that I represent, inclusivity, um, you know, fighting for women's rights, for if it's the food bank or period purse or any association that I have with all important to me, especially animals. Um, but it, the only part of it is a sad is that I believe, and hats off to the whole industry, I think there's no sh shop owner out there that is trying to not do the job or not treat everybody well. I just think maybe we can all still do better, including myself. I always achieve for, for perfection to do the best. And, and I hope with time, because it's not just inviting people to the industry to work, women to work, but also as women are coming in, when they're in their sh your showroom, do women feel different that you're treating men? You know, have your service team as an owner, you have a service advisor team. Are you making sure that you're treating anybody that's walking in equally? Men, women, LGBT community. Um, there's so many stories. I know a TikTok that went viral that uh, an LGBT uh, couple uh, didn't feel comfortable going to even get their car done. So I got tagged on it from multiple customers to say, hey, you got to go here. So we want to make this environment. People are avoiding to spend the begrudge service because they don't feel comfortable coming in. And if you ask any shop owner, nobody would want to sabotage your own business. But, you know, my only recommendation is, is maybe try to look at yourself internally and see what you could do. You know, make sure that when you're talking to men, women, LGBT community, you're talking equally the same. Make it feel uh, uh, in inclusive. I'm not saying you have to do the things that I've done. I've included stuff in my life and there's murals of the Leafs and the murals of, of dogs and there's murals of superheroes. There's all kinds of things and butterflies and flowers and I'm into the Star Wars and all kinds of stuff. But um, that's something that's unique to me. But at the end of the day, our job is to make everybody feel inclusive. If we want people to join the trade, we want women to belong in the trade we have to start even with our own customers that they feel comfortable. How are those people as parents gonna in recommend to come into the trade if they themselves are not even comfortable? Would you recommend to your child to come into the trade when you're not even comfortable walking into a shop? And, and I think people take also for granted that maybe men think you know more about a car than a woman does. Hey, there's Google, there's Siri, you can ask anybody on the internet. So, and also have that in view that your customers are all educated. All they do is got to look it up. So transparency with also, again, having an open mind. Um, I also had a conversation with a shop teacher this week and he needs to um, place a, a, a female co-op student. We've had many in the past and he's concerned about her placement. He goes, I have a daughter, which is great. So people are like stepping back and 
and asking the questions, making sure that somebody's comfortable. But he asked me if we placed her because we said we were at capacity and asked if we would, can make a considerations to have her because he knows she would be comfortable with the shop. Now I know my neighborhood. I love all the shop owners. I think we have a great, uh, like um, to me, they're never a competition. To me, they're my friends in arms. We go and it is a hard business. And yes, we're all addicted to it and we love it. And at the end of the day, we want to give good service, fix the cars. We all want the same thing. But why are people still uncomfortable with us? It's a begrudge service, yes. But what are we doing to make every single person? It's a people. It's like we can't look at it as male, female, or what gender, what background. We need to include everybody to feel. So maybe for a second, we could just look back and say, hey, am I doing the best I can? And I'm sure everybody is, but we can always like, you know, just look inside ourselves and what can my team do to make people feel comfortable? Are, what are you going to do to get those co-op kids? And, and imagine like in World War II, what happened? Who went and did all those jobs the men were doing? Women, and that was temporary. Imagine now we're in such a crisis. We have nobody to hire. Imagine if women joined the force. Imagine for having inclusive um, shops that women do feel comfortable working there. I have two service advisors. Um, I'm so proud of them, um, both women. And um, of course, Rui, who is incredibly um, patient and, and so understanding and so progressive. And I'm so proud of them and my team. Um, they make everybody feel welcomed. And I just, I hope that that's one thing I could rub off. And again, I think the whole industry tries their best. And I just hope that's something we could rub off a little more. I'll stop talking. I talk too much. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, that's amazing. Well, Catherine, there, there's an act to follow. Um, <laughs> Sorry. So, so uh, I mean, Josie is, is I, I think, you know, I, I know that this is sort of women in industry panel, but I think, you know, that it's Josie being Josie is amazing, uh, clearly. Uh, whether it was just Joe or Josie, uh, you know, what you're doing is, is clearly fantastic. Um, and, you know, why we're here to talk. Uh, but great lessons in there, too, and messages. Uh, um, so, Catherine, let, tell us a little bit about kind of your entry uh, into the aftermarket, and then we'll kind of talk a little bit about if there are times when, I don't know, no, well, tell us a little bit about your experience, and if you feel that at some points there were times when it could have been a little bit better, maybe if you'd been a man or something. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, I, I grew up in this industry. I, uh, I'm fourth generation to continue working in the automotive aftermarket. Um, when I was in high school, I actually had my sights set on being a technician. I wanted to work on cars. I love cars. They are my passion. So it was actually my high school tech teacher who said, do you know about the Canadian Automotive Institute, now Automotive Business School of Canada? And then I had my sights set there. I went to uh, Georgian, got my diploma in automotive marketing, went down to Northwood, got a bachelor's in aftermarket management came back to Canada and went, yeah, this, this is it. This is what I want. So um, started my career off selling oil and outside sales, um, joined some other prominent companies within the industry. And now I'm here at Dorman as key account manager um, for one of our largest customers across Canada. So I, I absolutely love it. As Josie was saying, this industry, we were addicted to it. We love it. Um, the passion. Um, I love what I do every single day. I say I sell car parts and I, I love that. Um, but really, as a female in this industry, there has been some hurdles I've had to overcome. Um, prior to Dorman, I was that feet on the street rep in Toronto and out to Ottawa. Part of what I had to do was technician training. And so there in itself lied some hurdles because it was my job to walk into that technician bay, set up my projector, my screen, and train technicians. And here I was, a young female in the automotive industry, training technicians on jobs that they pretty much already knew how to do. And I was coming in with tidbits and tips and tricks on how to do that job quicker, more efficiently, uh, turn cars in the bay. And I had to convince these guys that I knew what I was talking about. So I've always said as a female in this industry, my, my best tool is my knowledge. So knowing my product, knowing what, how it works on a vehicle, that is 
that's almost like my, my shield almost. So because there has been many times in those training or sales presentations at large WDs or at jobbers across the industry that I have been tested. There has been questions asked to me that I know would not have been asked if, if I was a male standing in front of that crowd. So knowledge is my armor. Knowing my product, knowing my value proposition, knowing what I'm there to talk inside and out, that's how I can almost prove myself that I, I'm worthy to be standing here. And I can't wait for a day. The work that we're doing, Josie, myself, other amazing females in this industry, no longer have to stand in front of that crowd and prove themselves. And we are getting there. So I'm really excited to see more and more females coming into higher up roles in the industry. Um, one thing we're continuously talking about at AIA is diversity. And that's diversity across all aspects, um, not just race diversity, gender diversity, but making sure we are hearing from the entire industry, from suppliers, all the way down to technicians and those end users that are using our products. So, so it's uh, we have a long way to go, but we, we've really come a, a really long way as well. Sure, I mean, it, it occurs to me, I mean, both, uh, both uh, you, Josie, and, and uh, you, Catherine, are both, you know, extremely passionate about the industry. And certainly, you know, that's not a rarity in the aftermarket, but it's, it's not always the case that, uh, you know, people coming into the industry see it as the only option that they want to do and that they're, they'll just overcome every obstacle. Have you, I'm going to ask this first of, of Catherine, just, uh, you know, looking at some of the barriers that you face, could you see that as being something that maybe is a less, slightly less passionate or not committed to this, like this is the road they want to be on and just saying, you know, as a young woman, like I just, I can go do something else while I'll be eat more and won't have to put up with this, this pushback and, and, just leave the industry or or people who think geez i'm going to get pushed back i'm not prepared to do that i want to go somewhere where i'll be more accepted or, and are we losing talent i think that might be a hurdle um at the same time it's been really interesting working with many of the players in the aftermarket to see how many females even males for that matter are working here working for our wds working for our jobbers who had absolutely no line of sight that they would ever end up in the automotive industry. And then of course, you, you still have your, a bunch of people in the industry who have that passion and their passion is leading them. And I think as a female, if you have a passion for this industry and you really love cars and, and car parts and making sure your customers are happy and they, they feel included and inclusive and it really does set you apart. Um, it's almost, my my entire career as a student and then as a working professional, the one piece of feedback I always get is I lead with my passion. So I think having a passion for what you do in any industry means you're waking up every day and you're not actually working. You're there just doing your job and, and you're happy to be doing it. So I think definitely passion means, but there's a lot of people in this industry too that are they're here because of their path that got them here and they were never really fully expecting to join the industry, whether aftermarket OE or anything. So it's, uh, it's interesting when you see that. And I think back to the women's conference that AIA puts on, I can remember the very first women's conference. It was a lot of admin, uh, a lot of females coming from a lot of prominent industry or companies within the aftermarket in admin roles, HR roles. And the great thing about that now is 10 some odd years later, we're seeing more people come in from operational or logistic roles or sales roles or even higher up. And, and that makes me so excited to see that kind of that switch there. Sure, sure. I'm going to ask you, Josie, if you think back to, I mean, I know you, 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 you said that you had, you know, obviously you had experience at Master Mechanic, you were working uh, in, in uh, the admin office and the head office there. So you, you had some kind of I'm going to say advantages coming into the shop uh, when you decide to make the move as an, an ownership. Uh, but was was there still some groundwork you needed to to lay there to to get kind of acceptance from the staff there, and, and uh, uh, or was it uh, were they hey Josie we already love you, uh, or was it something in between? You know what, um, it's a, it's a great question. You know my profession, you know my education was an accountant. I happened to my first full-time job other than Canadian Tire when I was young was literally master mechanics. So I've literally had the same employment for since 1992 with master mechanic. Um, 
so I mean, Andrew Wani was the owner. There was other and uh, other franchisees like Dan Peterson um, in the industry, Joe Mercanti. So I had people um, like in the background, and I focused on my advisors and the people that supported me. I always put that noise and there was a lot of noise in 1999. Um, I could say an example, people had a bet how quickly I would feel. And, you know, you just, you know, you just shrug it off. And I did, I had my goals and I, like everything I, I read in that, that Google review where I wanted to be. So I had, I had things where I wanted to be. Now with the industry for women, um, any, any woman that's listening or, or anybody that knows women, it needs, we have a crisis in our industry. We have a huge crisis. By 2025, even more um, people are going to be retiring. Imagine if we welcomed women, what a solution we can be um, for the industry. So it needs to start at home. Are people at home? Would you tell your children to come um, and work in the trades, in the automotive trades? I was on an AIA panel about seven, eight years ago, and I asked the crowd, would you ask, would you advise your child to get into the trades, become a mechanic? Everybody in the room put their hand up. And facts state at the moment that that is not the case. We are in crisis. Every shop owner out there is in, in, in crisis to find people. So I'm trying to change the scenario Let's talk about hiring people, men, women, women, transgender, anybody that wants to get involved in the thing. But it has to start at home. And then it has to go into school. And then it has to go to high schools. And then we need the job programs back. And then we need the, the shop programs back. There is a whole culture that needs to change. Are we teaching our children that, yes, you don't have to go to university. You can be coming to the trades. If you're a female male, we have a people problem. We, we can't even attract men. We, we can't attract women. We're not attracting anybody. So like, like there's a whole thing. And now I know the Ontario government is trying. And um, in, in, our, um, in our neighborhood, uh, one of the schools has been, uh, Bishop Morocco in our area has asked by the Toronto Catholic District Board to do a video to encourage the trades. And uh, myself and Rui have been asked to talk and I've actually um, uh, given them a recommendation to also interview for this video that they wanted to go on to television, radio, and uh, as an ad to encourage the trades, um, to even talk to uh, JF uh, at AIA and, and Diane Freeman at Arrow. I mean, we need to put it out there and needs, the culture needs to change or the industry. Now, what we can do from women, hire them, mentor them, get them at co-op change your environment at your shops, be more welcoming to everyone um, and, and try to get more people more passionate about the trades. There's good money, there's a career, there's, there's jobs. Like people are dying for like a, a career. And um, as a woman, as a man, if you want a career, a settle, uh, empower yourself. Um, even in my community, the Redwood Shelter, Women's Shelter, they have programs in the trades that they're connected to to get women back and get their lives back and everything they've been through with their kids and they put them in the trades so we need to continue we all need to be advocates and keep at it yes you know a hundred years ago women couldn't vote we couldn't have a bank account we couldn't have a credit card i mean you look back at the history of oh my god like we were considered property of a husband and you think now yes we've made some progress okay it's not that bad but we got to keep going like we need to talk about people and we need to refer it as what are we going to do to attract people all of all backgrounds and doesn't matter who you are um and attract it back to this trade you can make excellent money and we also have to do uh, you know i i'm into paying people well and i'm into this top uh, thing I won't even pay anybody under like 18 to 20 dollars I don't care if it's down it's a tire person we need to give people the right pay um you want you know track uh, um this stuff and also you know as for your competition and people we need to talk proper about our competition we are again we're soldiers in arms together we're not against each other we need to keep together elevate industry if you want to attract anybody and attract men and women because women could solve this problem imagine if men and women came into this women is the solution 
Um, if you think about it that way, imagine having to pull from both genders or any gender or non-binary, transgender, whatever, uh, whoever wants to work and wants to be in the industry. And yeah, you need to find the independence, the passion. Now, if you don't want it to be in the trades, that's another story, but we need to start encouraging it. The culture needs to start from home. And are the parents doing a better job teaching parents to be more, teaching more about equality and stuff? Yes, done a great job. The millennials, the millennials, and, and hopefully we can teach the alphas a lot more and we can keep going because they're, the, the, the boomers are retiring. So we need to do something and we need to do it fast. We're 20 years behind at least. Well, I think you touched on it, Catherine, uh, you know, uh, we had a question from, from, uh, you know, the, the attendees, you know, it was a pretty big question. And, and I think that certainly Josie has, has covered off some of that about, you know, why is there a lack of workers in the automotive trade? I mean, there's a, there's a lot of reasons though, right, Catherine? I mean, there's, I mean, I know that, you know, being, you know, working also with the AIA and the, the workplace uh, workforce studies. And yeah. I mean, there's, and that is a big conversation that's currently happening at the AIA right now. Um, I am just handing over my chairpersonmanship, I guess, if that's how you want to call it, to the new YPA chair, who I don't think it's been announced, so I'm not going to say who it is, but it will be announced at AGM next week. Um, and I'm also part of the Ontario division, and I hold my volunteer time with AIA very close to my heart because we speak a lot about these important initiatives and that's getting more people into this trade. Um, I also go back quite a bit to the Automotive Business School of Canada because it is one of my biggest passions to continue talking to students and letting them know of the opportunities in this industry. One of the greatest uh, phrases that I, I heard last year that I've kind of taken and used it as my own is we need to lift as we lead. So as we are moving forward in our careers, we need to continuously look behind us and see who's coming into our positions and who's coming into those entry level positions and making sure that we're lifting them up and preparing them for the future. I love calling students our future leaders because they are going to be our future leaders. All my work with ABSC, um, it's, it's Honestly, it blows my mind because I walk into that school and a lot of these students are, oh, we this, and I'm going to go work for a dealership and nice shiny rims and cars. And it's like, have you heard about the performance side of the aftermarket industry? And we're not just dirty car parts here. There's so much to it. There's collision. Um, there's, there's so many different avenues and opportunities for jobs here and getting that out there and letting people know about those opportunities. Um, and then also that for the trades, it's, I'm in my 30s and going through high school and kind of thinking about what we're going to do after high school, it was drilled into us. You have to go and you have to get a degree. That's what you need to do. So I think that that focus and that switch now needs to go back to trades and those skills are what's going to be moving our economy forward. Too many people are out there with a Bachelor of Arts degrees and what are they even working within their field? So we need to push more and more students that are in high school into those trades, talk to them about the programs at Centennial and really have that awareness top of mind when we're speaking to any of our future leaders. So it's, it's a big problem, but we are, we're starting and anybody that's going to speak to any type of student or college level, high school level, we need to be talking about our trades. Sure. It occurs to me also that through the pandemic that we are, you know, hopefully seeing uh, you know, the tail end of, uh, fingers crossed all around, you know, the automotive aftermarket in particular uh, was uh, one industry that uh, was allowed, uh, de declared to be an essential business, was allowed to keep operating. Uh, and uh, a lot of folks working in other industries that, that didn't have that, uh, uh, you know, have found themselves looking for other work, frankly. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I, I look at from the standpoint of folks coming into an industry and seeing an industry that's uh, pretty stable, uh, continuing to grow, lots of opportunities. Uh, you know, I, even Josie, uh, you know, the, a lot of people in industry wouldn't think they could go from a head office to like owning a business. Uh, it becomes your admin career and it's just an administrative career or whatever, a corporate career, if you want to call it that. And not making that transition to entrepreneurialism is something that um, 
I really believe the automotive aftermarket is particularly open to, um, and we're going to see more of that as more people retire or look to sell their businesses. And so getting folks in at the right end um, is super important and, and being honest about the, uh, the opportunities that the automotive aftermarket can provide, regardless of uh, where you are on the gender spectrum or LGBTQ uh, 2S uh, 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 identity. Um, uh, you know, there, there's some opportunity to not just have a job, but to, to do pretty well if you're, if you're willing to put the work in, right? Absolutely, 100%. Um, I mean, there's service advisors, uh, technicians, jobbers. Um, there's so much in the industry. You can just keep going and going. There's so many jobs. There's so many opportunities. But again, it has to start at home. It has to continue to grade school, high school. It needs to continue. You need to uh, be part of it, advocate, be part of be part of organizations like AIA and Aero, which I'm part of both. Um, I, I've uh, had the privilege of being on a few committees and also doing like surveys, uh, some of the surveys that come up um, through AIA. And it's an incredible finding and the stuff that we need to do to do better in the aftermarket. And um, we just, I mean, and essential, like, I mean, hats off to all of you and that we were essential and we kept the economy going. I mean, without vehicles moving, where would we have been in the, in, in the, in, in the pandemic? I mean, hats off to everybody. And, and we had to work, we had to go into people's cars. And, and COVID and all those measures we had to take, like hats off to everybody. We were surviving this. And I know there's many variants and, and people that haven't even had it for two years are getting it right now. And, and we're, we, we still have to keep our doors open, make modifications, do many modifications, but here we are. We're, we're a place to be. You can have a job, you can make money, you can have a career. It's not just, hey, you know, just like it's something you could do just because you don't feel like doing anything else. No, that whole perception needs to change. It's, it's an incredible thing. I love the industry and I'm, I'm gonna sit here and, 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 and I'll always keep advocating till one day we don't have to advocate for women to keep doing this, that it's not a topic anymore because we're they're out there and we're and we're all part of this so that's my hope and you can have you can shoot for the shoot for the moon and if you land at the stars you do great and and that's what and that's what i feel and, and i guess my favorite quote ever is people will maybe forget what you said people will forget what you did but they're never gonna forget how you make them feel and and that's the feel that i want if it's encouraging women encouraging people encouraging everybody from every background to get into the trade, get involved with your local schools. Um, like we don't want to get to just Centennial College. We need to start earlier um, and, and hopefully, and again, working with the politicians in my local area. I, I have, um, I've advocated in Ottawa for animals and I advocate also for women in positions and, and the stuff going on in Toronto, like so many things. I, I'm both involved with my MPP and PP in the area. And again, we got to keep advocating, like advocating and pushing. And I know AIA and AIR are both um, advocating and just like, um, you know, being able to get information in a few years because they're advocating. And there's that MP, uh, MPP from, uh, I'm sorry, MP from Milton, who's doing great to get those laws passed. Um, so we can get the information so we can stay in the aftermarket or 600,000 plus people are going to lose jobs if we don't get this information. So there's so much in the aftermarket to be involved with. And I encourage everybody to be involved with these organizations, read your articles, be involved, subscribe to stuff, stay current. Um, you have to stay involved and, and, and get involved with the, your community and, and the kids at the high schools and try to be in. Like I, I'm like, a, you know, me and the shop teacher, I'm Rui with the shop teacher. We have a relationship. Uh, the one previous, the one now, the one that Rui grew up with and unfortunately passed away, but the new shop teacher, you know, and we just gab about the industry. You know, go into the school, gone into school, talk to the kids, inspire them. Um, and again, let's let's inspire both male, female, transgender, whoever to come to come into the trade and let's keep going. And also government officials and and we just got to keep we got to keep at it. Right. Um, yeah, Catherine, I, I think about your story uh, listening to Josie, I think about your story about, uh, you know, even though you have, you know, multi generational family involvement in the business. But you had that one conversation, or maybe it was more than one conversation, uh, with a shop teacher uh, who said, "Hey, do you know about this? You know, at, at the Automotive Business School of Canada that that set you on this path, and 
it, you know, speculation tells me that, you know, he could have very well said, oh, you don't want to go in automotive. He could have. He, he definitely could have. And as um, a teenager, I, I realizing that I may be following in my father's footsteps here. And of course, as teenagers do, I went and worked for a dry cleaner and I, I tried my hand at working in an OE dealership because it was, oh, maybe I'll rebel a little bit. and I don't want to do what dad does and everything. But really, it came down to this is my true passion and this is what I love doing. Um, and it was actually a conversation with my shop teacher because I came to him discouraged after my co-op as a technician. And I said to him, I love cars so much. And this technician who's training me tells me that at the end of the day, he goes home and he doesn't necessarily want to work on his own cars. And now that that's the mindset of that one person. It's not the mindset of the entire industry, but I kind of went, I don't want to not work on my own cars at night. So how can I do something that I love so much, but also keep that passion alive? And I think it's really going through and figuring out all the different opportunities that are in this industry. Um, and that's what I used my co-ops for at Georgian. I, I did three co-ops at Georgian and I say the best thing I learned from them is what I didn't want to do in the industry. Um, <laughs> like I got to walk away at the end of four months, no bridges burned. Um, but that's where I realized that outside sales, that's what I love doing because I can walk into a jobber or an installer, automotive service provider, and, and kind of figure out like, hey, how can I bring more value to you and your customers with my, my products, my programs, all that sort of stuff. So it really, it was like trial and error. Where, where do I fit in this industry? So mentorships, I think mentorships are a great thing. There's, there's initiatives that still very ground level. I don't want to speak out of turn that YPA committee might be taking a look into because we really think having industry professionals connecting with students who are still figuring out their place in life can help them bring more people into this industry and show them the multiple different types of opportunities. So, cause he, yeah, my shop teacher could have said, oh, I don't think you want to go that way. But fortunately for me, he kind of laid out all my options and went, you can keep doing it this way. I think you could have a great career. You love cars, but have you heard about the automotive business school? And I hadn't. So having somebody there to kind of help guide us and show us where those opportunities are is it's a phenomenal thing. Let, let me ask you a, a, a kind of a follow up to the earlier conversation about going in being, uh, you know, I mean, the role has changed some for you, Catherine, uh, you know, and you've grown into the roles and your experience has grown. Uh, but do you find or do you believe that uh, uh, as a woman, you kind of your approaches may be different. Uh, is it does and and does that provide an opportunity for the company you're working for to, you know, try something a little different with maybe different customers that uh, weren't responding to, uh, you know, the guy going in. Uh, I think so. I think as females, um, we pick up on different things. We pay attention to different things and, and we approach everything a bit different. Um, when I first started at the oil company, it always made me laugh because I was, I was doing a lot of cold calling then. I would just walk in and say, hey, here's who I am and here's what I do. How can I help grow your business? Everybody thought I was a customer. I took them full by surprise. And by that point, I had already spied out what many or what oil supplier they're using, all that sort of stuff. So it's like you kind of fly under the radar and then all of a sudden, the, oh, wait, you're selling me something. <laughs> so um, I, I always laughed at that because they never expected it out of me. So, but I think as females, there's just certain things that we pay attention to, little detail or something like that. Um, I know for sure when I was making all my sales notes, uploading in Salesforce or CRM, I would always kind of put a section of, well, what did we talk about that wasn't business? Did he tell me something about his wife or his daughter? Some of that more personal. And then I, you'd always figure out a way to incorporate that back into the conversation. And it's like, oh, holy crap. Like she remembered that when it kind of, it breaks down that trust barrier and making, uh, having them trust you more. So I definitely think we have an advantage of females um, from our male counterparts and kind of those little things and how we operate and foster our relationships. At the end of the day, people buy from people who they like and have relationships with. So as a female, if it's easier for me to foster a relationship, I'm going to have some good sales numbers that month. <laughs>
Right, right. What do you what do you think about what you're hearing from uh, Catherine Josie? Does that does that all ring true with you? Uh, Catherine, spectacular. Um, one of my things is the detail oriented customer service. She said all the magic words. Um, it's it's incredible. I mean, women are magical. We can do anything we put our minds to it. To any woman that's listening, you can you make any goal, you can achieve anything you want. Um, the woman's body, whoa, what she goes through and what she can accomplish. And when there's a woman that wants to get something and, and succeed in something, whatever she may want to do, um, it's an incredible force that you would want on your team. Um, also, when you have if this like a lot of the schools went away from these uh, going back to the kids a little bit too um the the high schools got rid of their shop program like central tech in toronto used to be all trades got rid of it so once these uh, young kids come to you don't just make them sweep the floor inspire them mentor them inspire them men women doesn't matter who they are inspire them don't just like use them as your your shop garbage drawer like i mean you need to inspire these kids if you want them to come the crisis is there and as women i look at that and i'm like no this is not just about you know doing this and it's something that i brought to the table we need to inspire these people we need to hire women we need to be an example of what we can do and what incredible things we could do working together and um and working together with men and and funny enough, I don't have a single family member in my whole like genetic DNA that's even a mechanic. And I don't know, I'm enthralled. I don't know what I did in my past life, um, but I am completely enthralled in the automotive. And um, anybody wants a career. And, and again, to men, women, if you find you're in the industry and for some reason, someone is saying something to you inappropriately, the best thing I ever learned was from an ombudsman. She sued. She said to me, turn to the person. It doesn't have to be like an argument and even uncomfortable. They've just said something you don't like. You turn to them and say, is that how you would want your daughter or your mother or your sister to be treated? Let's keep the wife out of there. Um, um, <laughs> so, um, you know, like, is that how you would want your loved ones to be treated? Or is that how you would want, like, in their situation? So, like, yeah, like, let's, Let's have in perspective, like everybody has one of those people in their lives. So put it in perspective, like make them really educate people. So if you're a woman, you're in a situation, use that line. It, uh, it, like saved me so many times in my career. Use that line or men. Think back, like would my daughter or my, my sister or any uh, female influence in your life, your mother, would she be comfortable in the environment at the shop? Or would employees be other uh, employees that come in or the co-op students come in? Are we respecting them and make them not respect the trade and treat them like they're at the bottom of the barrel? No, we have to inspire these kids to come on. So, you know, it, I think it's a very important part of it is how we lead and what we do to, to make the industry more inspiring for all to come into it. Yeah, it's, And it's, women, it's, you got this, you can do this. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know, very early on uh, in, in our conversation, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, you know, sort of paraphrasing a little bit how, you know, take a step back as a, as a shop owner or, or you know, and, and w watch how your staff is interacting with, with customers and, and think, you know, are they doing it? Are, are they treating uh, different customers differently based on maybe how they look or how they act or, or how they believe their orientation to be, because we don't always know. Um, uh, and and uh, it's it's not necessarily, I'm going to put words in people's mouths, so I apologize for that, not necessarily intentional, right? It's just a... a no, like that's why sometimes you have to look back. And I've had actually peers, like other franchisee owners, come and observe me for the day and see if there's any tips. Like I've always keep humble. There's always, always stay humble. Treat everybody the same. Like the saying, they go the CEO, the CEO or the janitor. Like you always have to stay humble. You're not above your employees. You're a team, so you treat everybody, your customers, anybody that walks in the door. Doesn't matter what car they own. Doesn't matter how they dress. It doesn't matter who comes walks through your door or how they, you answer the phone or, or 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 what language they speak or what happens. Everybody deserves customer service. Yes, we are in the business of repairing cars, but we are in the business of customer service. We need to we need to give it. We need to be better than the dealer. We are better than the dealer. We don't even have to worry about the dealer. 
Um, it's us focus in the aftermarket, focus on what you're doing. Look at yourself, look at what you could do to be better. Like our, our friends in our neighborhood that own shops, we're buddies, we're friends. We, we're, we're not, we don't have to worry about each other. Focus on what you're doing and how to make people feel you're not, I don't want to say the word mansplaining because it could be a woman service advisor, but the way you've been talking to someone about their repairs, like they don't understand it at everything. Like I said before, people do their searching, like the way you talk to people, make them feel comfortable and with the repairs, you need to make your customers feel that, you know, you're talking to them and you're, you're advising them, you're, you're giving them recommendations and, and to trust and transparency. Um, I, I, there's digital stuff to help you with that too, but you have to keep in the relationship, add the digital, great repairs, and you have some magic happening. That's a lemon in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I have a question from <laughs> the a question from the uh, uh, from the attendees. Uh, Diane Freeman, uh, executive director Hi, at uh, Auto Aftermarket Retailers of Ontario, asks: uh, Do do uh, the panelists, both uh, Josie and Catherine, feel we need to educate the parents? on our industry so they can encourage their kids to come to the, into the trades. I'll get Catherine 100%. to start with this. Sorry, go ahead, Catherine. Sorry, That's Catherine. Okay. I just gotta mix it up here. Yeah. Oh, I hundred percent believe so. Um, and that's one thing I think we're still kind of fighting against the stigma of what our industry is and it has changed so, so much. I mean, we have so many service providers out there like master mechanic that care deeply about their customers and they're all about transparency and customer service. And then one bad apple comes and ruins a bunch. So, but that's not always the way it is. So educating parents on this is a great industry that your kids can join and then have a great career in a fulfilling career, a career that can bring them so many different opportunities. It's key. Um, it all starts at home, as Josie has said, um, as and a lot of kids are guided by their parents and where they should go to school, um, what kind of programs they should take. So I definitely believe that that's part of fighting the stigma that we are as an industry here for you, here for the safety and the longevity of your vehicle, because we, we care about your safety on the road. And that, that's, that's what it's about, is making sure that we start at home, really. What do you say, Josie? 100%. If it doesn't start at home, it doesn't start as children. Um, you know, bias, racism, um, uh, being uh, any, any issue in society, it's at home. It starts with the children. We need to start there. And then when they go to grade school, and then the high schools need to have more programs for the trades. They need to come back. And the government needs to get involved. Uh, we need to have mentors, uh, the automotive trade. Everybody has a part. And if it doesn't start at home, and you're ready to tell your kid they have to be a doctor or a lawyer. And if they become into the trade that, you know, that's just like backup if it doesn't work out and needs to be, yes, you can make money. You can have a career. You can have a steady job. Um, and, it, and again, them perceiving they're going into a mechanic shop and it, it is a respected. And I, I mean, we keep people on the road. We get people to Halifax to go to their trip for their family. We do something important. We keep people, people safe. We had, like that's our attempt. It's always to keep people safe. There is not one person listening or one shop owner that's not going to say that when you wake up in the morning and you go to work, that your job isn't to keep someone safe. And 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 that's not what their priority is: is to keep people and their car safe and advising them properly. Every single person wants that. So um, we just have to we have to continue it. And and hopefully, you know, as the government gets involved, as we get involved, and and more chatter happens, we don't stop till it, it, it keeps going back to where we were because the trades were important back when the boomers were around and then something happened along the way. I'm, a, I'm on the X generation. So I'm a little bit on, and all, on all sides there. Um, we, we go along with everything. We're easygoing generation. Um, but yeah, we need to go back. Right. right. I, mean, I know says. like I speak, speaking from experience, you know, I grew up in a household where uh, quite literally my father uh, turn upturned two garbage cans and then built a race car on them. But but when it came to taking shop at school, he's like, no, no, I'll teach you that. 
you know, and, and clearly they couldn't keep me away from it. But, you know, and probably for everybody's larger benefit, I did not become a technician because I don't think I have the patience for it. Uh, but, uh, you know, and then I, I think that plays itself out all over. He was a tradesman uh, and, you know, I wasn't going to stay in the trades. I was going to, in his perception, you know, uh, take higher schooling, right? So, uh, um, and there's still a lot of that perception, but, uh, you know, I have a question uh, from uh, the, the uh, attendees. Uh, uh, do panelists think that one of the reasons that there's a lack of workers in the automotive trade is because of some sort of bad reputation that the automotive shops have or the trade in general that causes people not to want to get involved in the trade? What do you think, Josie? Let Catherine speak. Should, okay. should let right. Catherine speak? <laughs> See, I feel like I speak too much. Yeah, I can answer it if you want. Let her go first. <laughs> Go for it. I have I have a few two cents I can add in after. Okay, go ahead, Josie. Okay. Um, I believe that every shop owner is proud of their shop. I believe that it's a begrudged service. That's where it starts from. So all I can say is I don't believe any shop owner goes and to deceive anybody. I think sometimes mistakes happen. And I think as shop owners, maybe if that mistake or your, your mechanic technician has made a, a mistake, own up to it be accountable, fix it. That's all the customer wants. So in that stuff that we're, is that perception? I think we're better than we're used to. I think we still can make the industry does still have a little bit of that perception. I still hear it from people. So we just got to keep going. Like I said, shop owners, look at yourself, whoever's listening to this, look into yourself, what else you can make? What, what can you do for that bias to disappear forever? Um, and, and, and unfortunately, it starts with when you buy the car, you go into a dealership or you buy a used car. Hmm, experience sometimes is not so good. Then you go for your warranty and then the dealer gives you a hard time sometimes. You know, that's what that's where I like I'm never worried about the dealer because I already have customers that I literally have to call the dealer to advocate for them to get something under warranty that should be under warranty. And they're saying I had one one person just uh, a month ago that they said, Oh. Um, we said, this is on the recall. Well, it's not on our computer. It doesn't show up. Even though the recall is there, we can see it. It's not on their computer, so they don't care. And I'm like, no, that's not going to work. You're going to change the motor on, on this particular Hyundai with this motor. So like we advocate for people. So that's where like I try to put the, the, the dealer world aside. And, and, and I think that's where it starts. It's not us. I think it starts from that world. Because, you know, uh, every other day there's on, on TV is a show what uh, dealers did or what happened and they bought a car, used car and all the negativity around it. So that's where it starts. So by the time they come to us, we want to give them that good experience. And, and, and again, transparency, honesty and all those things that people are looking for is just what we can continue doing to stop the stigma, stop the bias and we can just keep going. I try to lead by example and I am 100% sure that every shop owner on this thing believes they're doing the same thing. So we just got to keep at it. And eventually people will believe it. And the bad apples, well, they're the bad apples. Eventually they'll, they're going to disappear. They won't survive. So we just, I, I always focus on the, the, the most versus like the one or two uh, bad apples, you right. know, because eventually they'll be washed out. They'll be flushed. So right. let's and focus on it and continue on our yeah, path because we're on a good path. You've seen certainly seen all of the kind of ghost car shows on uh, expose news items where, you know, they go to That's twelve. Sh- going out. They, go to, they go to twelve shops and and they're like, but these three shops, you know, did something crazy. You know, the nine of the shops were great, and then that they stop talking about the nine shops, and then they they focus on the three shops Thank or you. one shop or two shops that were just grasping at straws because they didn't have the training to con- execute the repair and then they get nervous and then they're in front of a camera and then they're saying all the wrong things and uh you know uh they're they're not always uh the one thing i will say about you know this industry is not always the best communicators we just got to keep at it in the news and, and and getting out there and and advocating and, and, and showing positivity in your communities. Let your communities believe that you are different, that the aftermarket is different. You know, dealerships, they're corporations. I'm not saying they're going out to do anything wrong either. Like, by all means, I'm not, I'm not trying to put any negativity on, but like when it starts from buying the car, that's where it starts, or a used car, or like these segments that come, or customer complaints that they have to go to the nice man on 
and um, on the TV and, and help them fight something because they bought a used car and they're in a disaster or the kilometers have been pulled back. Like, look at all the stories they talk about. How rarely do they talk about positive stories? I've had, you know, like so many positive thumbs because of my signs and the messaging and the stuff I do. I've been fortunate enough to have positive stories. So many, so many to, to, to even like, it's, it's been the big biggest achievement in my life. Like every single memory I have and events or events or any, even any review, like I feel so blessed to be in the industry and what I've been able to accomplish. But, you know, we all got to do it together. And I think we can. I, I, th I think we're better. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch switch up because we're down to our last five minutes or so. Uh, so I'm gonna ask anybody anybody who's no no it's been awesome, uh, Josie. Uh, uh, anybody who has any other questions, please uh, put them through uh, on the chat now. But I wanted to ask you, Catherine, uh, from your perspective now, you know, with the uh, uh, responsible role and uh, and some years in uh, working in the industry now. What can uh, maybe larger organizations do uh, uh, or midsize to to encourage uh, and support women uh, coming into the industry and kind of the, I mean, you mentioned, you know, women have been in HR roles and roles such as that and maybe some marketing stuff for a long time, but in the less traditionally female roles, what, 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 uh, what can the companies do? Uh, in terms of attracting women, I think we need to really have some mentorship programs. I think there's some really, some big companies that can have some mentorship programs. They can work with schools and really encourage more females to take a look at opportunities into this industry. Um, but really as a whole in Canada, I think we need more co-op placements at the higher levels of the industry. Um, because once you get to jobbers and service providers, they those are where the majority of our co-op students go today. We need more manufacturers, suppliers, vendors in this industry providing co-op opportunities to students today. We also need more warehouse distributors providing co-op opportunities. So whether male or female, but we do we have been seeing and bigger influx of more females interested in this industry. So we really need to figure out how we can get them not only interested, but applying to our companies. We need to figure out how we can attract them and keep them. Um, I think training is key um, across all in, uh, sections of the industry, sectors, sorry. Um, training, mentorship, co-ops, those are probably the big three to get anybody, any move led into this industry. Excellent, excellent. Um, if there are any other questions, please ask them now while we uh, just kind of uh, wrap it up here. But it certainly sounds like there's uh, uh, been improvement uh, over the last decade or so in acceptance of, of women. There's certainly no argument, at least from where I sit, that uh, there are some excellent uh, female professionals bringing a whole new dimension uh, of value to the aftermarket and their communities, uh, uh, Josie, looking at you, uh, in in very special ways. Um, but not just Josie; uh, others as well. Uh, you know who are? Uh, I know there's one shop owner uh, who I had hoped to have on this panel. Who's like, uh, I'm in Hawaii, uh, <laughs> so you're, I'm going to have to take a pass. So, so you know, um, uh, Josie is definitely not a one-off. Uh, it, it is uh, uh, really uh, a place where at many levels, uh, Catherine mentioned in logistics, in uh, management, in finance, uh, you know, the, the head of one of our uh, largest uh, warehouse distribution organizations uh, is, is a woman. Um, and of course, we all know what, even at the OEM level and the automakers, they've all been very, very well served by by uh, female executives, very professional, very effective um, for a long time now. So it's not new. Um, it's not a question of being token uh, females at all anymore, but there's certainly a lot of room for a lot more, right? 100%. Okay, yeah, I want 50% and more females on our sales team because I'm tired yes. of being like four of 100. So. <laughs> okay, okay. So. Room for room, room to grow for sure. And yeah, I have uh, I have quite a few relationships with the other female shop owners in Toronto and and across Canada and some from the states and 
there, there's, there's, there's so many. I am in contact with all of them and I have done mentorships and I will continue to mentor and, uh, you know, continue to hire women. And again, we, you, we can only, we can only lead by example and keep at it in every area. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And Evelyn, you inspire me. Thank you so much uh, for letting me be part of this. And I probably could talk for the next 24 hours. <laughs> Me too. Um, yeah. We, we, yeah. We, we won't make we won't make uh, Josie talk for 24 hours. Uh, we're going to we're going to we're going to make her stop and go uh, go go rest for a while. This has been fantastic. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you, Josie and Catherine. Uh, look forward to uh, seeing you all in person before too long, I hope. And uh, everybody take care of yourselves, take care of each other. And uh, we'll see you. Uh, uh, next session tomorrow at 1 p.m. Uh, the digital shop, uh, your importance of your digital footprint with in motion branding and uh, Todd Richardson. Uh, hope to see you all there. Thank you very much. And go Leafs go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>